From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Earl Foreman, Johnny, down in Sarasota. Don't tell me, Earl. Uh, the Florida weather's finally behaving itself. The water in the Gulf has warmed up, so I'll grab my fishing clothes, tackle box, a couple of rods and reels. Maybe you better grab your Levi's boots and saddle and a couple of six-guns instead. Huh? What is this, a western? It may be an eastern western before we're through. Listen, Florida is the leading cattle state here in the deep south. I had heard something to that effect. Okay. The freezing weather a short while back hit some of the ranchers pretty hard. To say nothing of the tourist trade. Right. Ordinarily, the year-round pasturage makes it unnecessary to lay up a lot of hay and feed for the winter. That figures. But this year, thanks to the freeze, the cattle were so weakened by malnutrition and then sloshing around in soggy pasture land that, well, at least a couple of hundred thousand of them have died. Well, what's your problem, Earl, outside of the high cost of steak? A rancher has just hit me with a big fat claim. Oh, uh-huh. how much? $78,750. Says that he lost his entire herd. Well, I knew a lot of them had lost quite a few, but the entire herd? Yeah. You coming? I sure am. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri-State Life and Casualty Company, Sarasota, Florida office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Eastern-Western matter. Expense account item 19480, plane fare and incidentals, Hartford, Connecticut to Sarasota. As I expected, Earl Poorman met me at the airport. We headed north on Route 41. Thirteen miles later at Bradenton, we turned east on 64 after grabbing a late lunch. That's item 2, 575. Then, still traveling eastward, we crossed the Kissimmee River onto a narrow, unimproved road into the swampland. And it struck me that what should have been lush green vegetation in this low, damp country was brown and lifeless. That's what the cold weather did, Johnny. All that grass, that good pasture froze and rotted away. No wonder the cattle haven't been eating well. But didn't I read somewhere they were fed the ruined orange crops? Yes, but that still didn't save a lot of the herds. Losses have been pretty heavy, huh? Yeah, but as I told you over the phone, Trimble is the only one I know of who lost all his steers. Is that the one who's made the insurance claim? Yeah, Bart Trimble. His fence starts at the next turn in the road. Have you had many claims, Earl? Oh, a few, a month or so ago, small ones. Not many of these people insure their herds. There, that's where Trimble's place starts, you see it? I saw it all right. Hundreds of acres of wet, brown, dead-looking pasture land. I also saw the steers, hundreds of them, their carcasses lying there rotting in the sun. Or what was left of them. The buzzards had done well. 525 head, Johnny. But surely some of them must have survived. Not according to the claim I received. That's why I called you immediately. Earl, you said the other claims were filed a month or so ago. I hoped you'd catch that. Why did Trimble wait so long? That's another reason I called you. Yeah, I see what you mean. Uh, here's his gate. Let's we'll see what he has to say. The Trimble place was unexpectedly new and tidy looking. The main house was a concrete block affair, all white with a slab roof. Behind it was a barn and a corral. The stack of bale hay was obviously for the horses and hardly big enough to feed a herd of steers. A few chickens pecked around here and there. The woman who opened the door was about 40, tall and nice-looking, well-made up, almost out of place on a cattle ranch. Yes. Oh, Mr. Foreman, how are you? And her voice was soft, gentle, pleasant. How do, Mrs. Trimble? It's nice to see you, Mr. Foreman. Won't you come in? I hear you say Foreman, Betty? Yes, Bart, and he has a friend with him. Well, I won't kid you, Mr. Foreman. I'm glad to see you. Howdy. I hope you brought me a nice big insurance check. Uh, this is Johnny Dollar, Mr. and Mrs. Trimble. He's with our company. Well, how do you do, Mr. Dollar? Won't you please come in? Thank you. Dollar, I think I've heard of you. Oh. Sit down, won't you? Supper will be ready in a little while, and of course you're going to stay, aren't you? Johnny Dollar. Well, now, that oh, depends. Oh, now, of course you'll stay. I really should get back to Sarasota tonight. My wife... Now, wait a minute. Now I know. You're the insurance investigator. That's right. And what's he doing here, Pullman? What's there to investigate? Now, you may be trying to say I killed off the herd myself to collect the insurance money. I said nothing of the sort. Then what's to investigate? I told you. I don't like this, and I'm telling you right to your face. Now, Bart... You shouldn't talk like that. Well, it's the truth. Just what do you think you're going to do around here, Dollar? Bart, please. Well, that depends, Mr. Trimble. Does he have to say it's okay, Pullman, before you can pay my claim? Yes, he does. 
Well, believe me, if I'd known this was the kind of outfit I was dealing with, paying premiums to... Uh, okay. All right, poke around as much as you want. Stay around as long as you like. We'll bed you down, we'll feed you, we'll show you what kind of people we are. Just don't get in my way. I've got a lot of work to do. And don't tell me I'm a crook. Now, let's be reasonable about this. Me? I'm being reasonable. You're the one that... Well, uh, what do you want, Shorty? Well, you told me to tell you, boss. Tell me what? The, the truck has come to pick up them hides. And help them load them on the truck. Go ahead, go ahead. You're selling the well, hides from those animals? I will. Sure, why not? Oh, we could salvage, that is. Anything wrong with that? Nothing at all. All right. You want horses to snoop around, help yourself. Saddles are in the barn, but just stay out of my way. Come on, Shorty, let's get out where the air is nice and clean. Sure, boss. I'm sorry, but Bart's been so upset over losing all those steers. Well, of course, we can't blame him for that. He's been working so hard, trying to save some of the hides and sell the carcasses for fertilizer. Yes, I know. But with so many ranchers trying to do the same thing. Why did he wait so long before filing his claim, Mrs. Trimble? Well, because he's been so busy and... Because he hoped he could salvage something from the herd, I guess. Or because this lapse of time has given the bodies a chance to decompose? What? Has given the buzzards and other scavengers a chance to remove any evidence that maybe those steers were deliberately... Oh, no. Oh, surely you don't think for a minute that my husband would... Where can I find the nearest veterinarian? Well, the vet we use is up in Kissimmee, okay. but... Okay. But, Mr. Dollar, you... you don't... Well, you can't possibly think... I'll let you know what I think after a good cow doctor has a look at those animals. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli is an exciting beginning to a stirring song. It is an historic salutation to the efforts of a valiant group of fighting men. Why is their history glorious? What spurred them on? Patriotism and desire for excitement are sometimes given for reasons, but these are not the answers. The answer is, these were men of vision, men who understood our country's needs. Respect, honor, and prestige are things that go hand in hand with a country's greatness. Major Smedley D. Butler recognized this in the year 1915. At that time, our diplomatic negotiations with Haiti were disrupted by Kako Bandits, who perilously affected the lives of some United States citizens in Haiti. A contingent of Marines, under the command of Major Butler, was sent in to bring the bandits under control. Though they were holed up in Fort Liberté, Major Butler found an opening in the wall and led a terrifying charge through the breach that resulted in very dangerous hand-to-hand -hand combat for himself and his men. Amid a furious onslaught of cocker bandits and a hail of enemy bullets, Major Butler succeeded in overcoming the resistance and creating a peaceful atmosphere. His grateful country awarded him the Medal of Honor for bravery, forceful leadership, and action above and beyond the call of duty. The second time he was awarded this high honor. Major Smedley Butler had a code of conduct born of years of devotion and service to the United States of America. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Eastern Western Matter. At dinner that night, Bert Trimble had changed his tune, was very apologetic. Almost too much so, and too nice. I... Uh... I didn't mean it, Mr. Dollar, what I said before. At least, not the way I said it. But this whole thing has hit me pretty hard. Losing over 500 steers and a handful of cabs. I told you, Bart, when they all went so quickly that night, you should have been suspicious. What uh, night, Mrs. Trimble? It was the last big freeze. Yes, I got back here late. I'd been up to Lake Wales trying to beg some feed. No luck. Then it blew up cold. By the time I got back here, got the hands rounded up. How many, Mr. Trimble? Well, there were five of us, including Shorty Skinner. I've seen that Shorty somewhere before. Oh? Well, anyhow, when we got to them, the cattle were all bunched up at the north fence. We thought we'd drive the strong ones back here, where they'd have some shelter. And we could give them the hay we keep for the horses. But they wouldn't move. Most of them couldn't move. And it was dark, and the freezing wind was cutting across the swamp. 
So all we could do was come back here and pray. Next morning, they were dead. All of them. I've put everything I had into this ranch. Every penny I saved from my factory work up north, Betty's money from nursing, even cashed in my own life insurance policy. And now they're gone. So if I got a little nasty, well, I guess a man can take only so much. It's been awfully hard for Bart these past three years. And just when things were going good. Your hands bunk out in that building beside the barn, huh? Only Shorty skinned out all the steers we could. The other boys left. I still owe Shorty some wages. I'm going to ask a pretty blunt question, and I want an honest answer. Huh? Had you ever thought of giving up, going somewhere else? Sure, lots of times. For Betty's sake, too. Even thought of going out to California. I see. She has relatives out there, all doing fine. They've kept after us to go out there and crop farm with them. Uh, maybe I should have. But we stayed, didn't we, dear? Yes, I wouldn't give up. Even Betty reconciled herself to sticking it out. If only we'd known that this was going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. We talked on for a couple of hours, but got nowhere. And finally, Earl and I plunked into our beds in the guest room. Mine was beside the open window. Now, when Earl Poorman sleeps, he's dead to the world. But he snores mightily. So, after throwing a couple of shoes at him, I gave up and managed to drop off with a pillow wrapped around my head. That was a mistake. An almost deadly mistake. Johnny. Johnny. Johnny, wake up. Wake up. Johnny. Johnny, you hear me? Johnny. Uh, what? Wake up. Oh, oh my head. I... Now stand up. I'll help you. Breathe deeply. Oh, Can't you smell it? Huh, what are you talking about? Deep breath. Deep breath. Come on. What? What are the... It's chloroform. Yeah, yeah, on your pillow. Holy hell. Ah. I threw it out the window, your pillow. It was saturated with chloroform. Give me give me a hand, Earl. I'm, I'm dizzy. Oh, Somebody came in that window. The pillow was over your head. You you see him? No, no, but Johnny... Oh, let me sit down again. Yeah. <laughs> By the window. Now breathe deeply. Oh, yeah. I rolled out of bed in my sleep, that narrow bed, or I'd never have wakened. I heard the door slam, then I smelled it. But who? Johnny, I knew I'd seen that Shorty Skinner somewhere. Yeah? It was on a road gang over near Sarasota, a prison gang. You sure? I was driving my brand new cat. As I passed him and the rest of that glowering bunch, he let fly with a handful of mud. Now, if you ask me, he's the one who came in here and tried to chloroform. But why? That's what I'm going to find out right now. No, wait. I'll be feeling okay in a minute. Let me handle it. By the time I was able to navigate and get dressed, Mrs. Trimble called us for breakfast. To say the Trimbles were upset over what had happened to me would be an understatement. Breakfast waited while we all went out to the bunkhouse. Shorty was gone. Took what little he owned with him, too. Has either of you any idea why he'd attacked me? Good heavens, no. But I never did really trust that man. He was such a sneaky-looking... Like a little rat. Yet he was the only one who stayed when I couldn't keep their wages up to date. Where would he ever get hold of chloroform? That's the part I don't understand. From the locker, dear. Back in the barn. Huh? You know, the stuff we got to put that old sick mare out of the way. Oh, yes, of course. I think why Shorty did this is pretty obvious, Johnny. Yeah? He was afraid you'd find out what and who killed off this herd. Bart, look. Here, Betty. The note on top of this bunk. Hey, let me see it. What's it say, Johnny? I'm tired, I'm tired, working for no pay. I will leave you know where to send my pay when you collect on that there insurance, Shorty. Shorty. Shorty Skinner. The crazy fool. Wanted his money. He knew I had none, but I could collect plenty on the insurance if he poisoned my herd. Oh, was it poison, Trimble? What? You didn't seem to think so before, but now that you have somebody to pin it on... No, no. I now you mean... seem pretty sure of it. Mr. Dollar. No, Johnny, it must have been Shorty. Maybe, maybe not. When the vet arrives, if he decides the herd was poisoned, okay, we'll take it from there. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars. And behind each star, there stands yet another flag, representing one of the 50 states. Wyoming's state flag pays homage to the monarch of the Great Plains, the bison, or buffalo as we call him. 
Set over the bison is the great seal of Wyoming, almost as a brand. The red on the flag's border represents the Indians who knew and loved the country long before white settlers arrived. It also represents the red blood of the pioneers who gave their lives in reclaiming the soil. The red, white, and blue border of the flag indicates Wyoming's oneness with the Union. Wyoming's state flag, the flag of the 44th state to enter the Union, was adopted on January 31st, 1917. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Eastern Western Matter. The veterinarian arrived from Kissimmee. He, Bart Trimble, Earl Foreman, and I rode out on horseback to inspect the dead cattle. As I had anticipated, the vet made it plain that the bodies were too far decomposed for him to tell anything. Until, that is, he noticed a pale purplish line around the inside edge of a watering trough at a far corner of the fence. Whoever used it didn't realize that it'd leave this telltale ring around the trough. Used what, Doctor? Now, let me scrape off a little, make sure. You think it's a poison, Doc? If I can taste it without getting enough to hurt me. Ooh. Well? Yeah, no doubt about it. Panorphic acid. That's what killed the herd? Yeah, beyond a shadow of a doubt. That's not a very well-known poison, Doctor. I know. It's used almost entirely in laboratory experimentation. I remember it well from my college days. But out here? Who did this to me? Who did it? You don't know? Shorty. Who else? Mr. Dollar. Look, I'm going back to the ranch house to a telephone. I'll see you when you get back there. I called the state police to get out on all points on Shorty Skinner. Then I started on the police in the neighboring towns. The second call to headquarters at Lake Wales got me unexpected results. Sure, we got him right here in the clink, sir. Oh? Well, what are you holding him on? Just vagrancy, no visible means of support. Found him sleeping on a bench in the park about 9.30 last night, so we hauled him in, let him put his X on a police blotter. His what? His X, you know. I certainly do. Thanks very much. The others hadn't got back from the pasture yet. Mrs. Trimble was in the kitchen making lunch. Quietly as possible, I sneaked into their bedroom. Carefully hidden in the desk, I found a lot of letters from the relatives in California. Letters urging that they give up the ranch, do something, anything to get the money out of it and move to California. Those letters were addressed to only one of the Trimbles. They were addressed to... And then I saw it neatly framed on the wall, a diploma. A diploma from the famous Lippenwall School of... Why, Mr. Dollar, what are you doing? Mrs. Trimble, I found out that Shorty Skinner has served time. Shorty? At least to the extent of working on a road gang. What for, I don't know. Then he is a criminal. Then there's no question about who poisoned the herd. Oh, you know about the vet's findings, that they were poisoned. Well, no. No, but I thought it was understood. A lot of things have been understood, wrong things. Did Shorty give you a home address when he came to work here? Yes. Yes, he did. Do you think he'd go there after what he's done? I'd like to see it, please. It's here in this top drawer. Yes, here. That's not his writing. No, that's mine. You see, Shorty can't write. Oh? So he couldn't have written this note you found in his bunk. But who... But look at it. Doesn't that curly Q on the letter T look like the one here when you wrote his address? And how about this capital I? Good heavens, Mr. Dollar. Friends who wanted you to go to California, and you wanted to go. Of course. But as Bart told us, you reconciled yourself to staying here, apparently. I did. I did stay here, even though I wasn't happy. Then the big I, freeze I... gave you a chance to kill off the herd, collect a lot of insurance money, and get away with it. You thought... Mr. Dollar, how dare you? The method? You? A little-known poison you'd learned about back in the Lippenwall School of Nursing. No. But no. you hadn't expected me here to investigate, so you had to get rid of me. How? As a nurse, you knew all about chloroform. Look, Mr. Dollar... It was a natural, with me sleeping with my head on the pillow. And you knew that Earl was a sound sleeper. He's been here before. And who'd get blamed? Shorty, because he'd left. Only Shorty had left long before that. What? He was picked up in Lake Wales at 9.30 last night. What? Well, then, no, listen... You killed the herd. You tried to kill me. Is that true, Betty? Bart. Tell me. Is it? Yes. Yes, it's true. You know how I hated this place. This horrible, miserable cattle ranch. This living out in this godforsaken wilderness. Betty. Well, you wouldn't do anything about it, so I did. Oh, good Lord. But I failed. But 
بابت Item three, fifty dollars to a lawyer at the county seat who took my deposition. It'll be used in the trial of Betty Trimble. As for Bart Trimble, well, I'm sorry for him. Expense account total, including transportation back to Hartford, two hundred seven dollars even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. It doesn't take a war to make a hero, nor does it take a situation filled with an onslaught of deadly enemy gunfire, bombs, and mortars. It takes a man to make a hero. And the man's qualities of greatness are based on his code of conduct. It serves him in peace as well as war. In August 1916, when the United States was still at peace with the rest of the world, part of our fleet was anchored off Santo Domingo City, the USS Memphis was in danger of total destruction from a hurricane. Only the efficient operation of the engines and boilers could get her out of the critical area. Lieutenant Claude A. Jones was senior engineering officer aboard. In rapid succession, boilers and steam pipes began bursting about him, scalding him with clouds of steam. Thousands of tons of water came down on him. In complete darkness, Lieutenant Jones nobly remained at his post as long as the engines would turn over. His supreme unselfish heroism inspired the men with him. When the boilers exploded, Jones, with two men, rushed into the fire rooms and rescued the men trapped there. In the face of death by drowning, burning, or suffocation from the scalding steam, Lieutenant Claude Jones performed a heroic feat because he felt it was his duty to do what he did. He earned the Medal of Honor because he had a code of conduct that served him well. Now here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week... One honest woman, two honest men. Yet $100,000 was gone. Fact. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Originates in Hollywood and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote today's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Vic Perrin, Jack Moyles, Marvin Miller, and Herb Vigrid. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. is Dan Coverly speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.